Welcome to Street Racers. This week, the drivers are on a bit of a break between rounds four and five. So we're coming to you from London Science Museum for an Electech special. Here's what's coming up. Motoring forward with Morgan. Electrifying classics in California. And Mahindra on a mission in India. The cars on display here at the Making the Modern World exhibition are prime examples of just how far motoring has come over the past couple of centuries. And there's one British car manufacturer in particular that has lasted the test of time, family-run Morgan. And at this year's Geneva Motor Show, they showed how you can keep bang up to date while sticking firmly to your roots. What we like about the Geneva Motor Show is it seems to be the sort of choice platform to unveil new products for every manufacturer. Always been in the same location, flanked by some, some big names and we're very proud that we can come here and do this and uh, it's a very big part of our annual event lineup. Morgan began life in 1909 building three wheels. The Morgan family are still at the helm, we remain privately owned, entirely British. Today we have established a niche, if you like, where we combine the best bits of our past, which is hand-building, coach-built traditional sports cars, but in order to remain competitive nowadays, we do have to embrace modern technology. Last year we chose Geneva as the platform to launch our EV3 concept, fully electric three-wheeler, and we partnered with the fashion brand, retailer Selfridges, who were also founded in 1909, like Morgan were. Morgan are very comfortable taking a big V8 and putting it in a car. Working with electric has been a huge learning curve for the company. I think the biggest challenge for us has been installing that high voltage equipment safely, not just for the customer, but actually for the chaps at the factory that are building the cars. The Morgan factory is a very hands-on environment, lots of people hitting things with hammers and cutting things with saws. So obviously the architecture is taken from the combustion three-wheeler we do and we're having to replace that engine. So the challenge was how do we make the front of this vehicle equally as functional and purposeful? There was no need for an air intake but there was a need to dissipate cooling. So we've sort of taken the inspiration of cooling fins with the brass detailing you see on the front. Morgans have always typically had quite a unique face and the eyes of that face have been quite important. So we launched this car with a single monocle because we thought there was a little light-hearted classical nod to, uh, to the era that was inspired. We can't ignore the future moving forward. Electrifying combustion engines and going to full electric is something that any company does have to take very seriously. The EV3 for us, as a small volume product, was our opportunity to put a toe in the water of that world and explore whether Morgan can adopt electric safely and whether or not we're ready to do so. We've just acquired significant funding from the UK government to invest in electrifying future products, potentially. So it is something we're taking very seriously, and this has given us the confidence that we're able to do it. From three-wheelers to the racing four-wheelers, and a lesson in how to manage the all-important FE pit stop. Time for race school with Mauro Engel. The biggest difference in a Formula E pit stop for sure is the car change. We have an energy limit of 28 kilowatt hours per car, which means half an hour of driving. Unlike any other form of motorsport, the driver jumps out and jumps into his second car. So it's really on the driver and on the mechanics to be able to do a pit stop, a change of car, within 20 to 25 seconds, which is a real challenge. From the moment we enter pit lane, there's a few rules we have to obey. The first one, obviously, being the pit speed limit. Pit speed limit is 50 kilometers an hour, which we need to hit or not be above from the moment we enter pit lane. Second most important one is that the driver needs to remain strapped in the car until he comes into his pits and stops. Also very important is we have a minimum pit time. In this case here in Buenos Aires, it's 57 seconds. Formula E and the FIA want to make sure the teams and drivers have enough time to complete the safe car change. 
Getting out of a Formula E car is not actually as easy as it might seem. The space inside the monocoque is very limited, so you'll see a lot of drivers twist their upper body to get in or out of the car. And every driver sort of has his own technique where he puts his hands in order to get out as quick as possible. The other thing you'll obviously see is the drivers removing the steering wheel. Getting into the car, you can actually get away with leaving it on, tilting it, as the bottom and top part of the steering wheel is actually very narrow. You can just about get your knees past the steering wheel and down into the monocoque. With respect to the belts, you have what they call a six-point belt. You have two shoulder belts, two hip belts, and what they call two crotch straps. They're all plugged in, and as soon as you turn and twist that buckle, they all release at the same time. It's quite a quick release. It's a lot harder for the mechanics to get you into the second car and to buckle all these different points back up as quickly as possible. That's why when you're watching the Formula E races, there's two mechanics strapping a driver in at the same time. As a driver, you can't actually see any far right or far left. So the engineer has to have one eye on the fast lane and see if there's any oncoming traffic, any oncoming cars. And if the fast lane's clear, he can release you into it. Otherwise, you might end up with a drive-through penalty if you do an unsafe release. Back here at the London Science Museum, this is the Rover Jet 1. It's the world's first gas turbine powered car and it was unveiled in 1950. It was supposed to be the power source of the future, but a slow response and poor fuel consumption meant that it didn't quite work out. Of course, we now know that electric motoring is the way forward and in the USA, the world of EVs is taking off in a whole new way. Think California. Think classic cars. Think again. My name is David Bernardo. I have a company called Electric Motors. Our focus is taking vintage uh, VWs and Porsches from the 60s and 70s and make them electric. The design of these European cars from the 60s and 70s that strikes a chord, I don't know what to tell you. I think it's something built into our, our DNA. We just, they're kind of cute, they're kind of homely, they kind of have little smiley faces on the front of them. So this is uh, one third of the batteries that are in the car. They're up front here in the fuel tank area. Again, we just utilized the hole that was in there. We kept the spare tire. We have another battery box uh, behind the rear seats. Here's our charge port. We can plug into any public charger there. On top of that is uh, our battery charger. Uh, here in the Beetle, we have one. In the Porsche, there's two. I take lots of people for rides in these cars that have never even been in an electric car, and they're just they're amazed by the performance and the quietness and the cleanness. People have sort of played with them and hot rodded them for, you know, the last 50 years. And uh, this is just kind of a new take on, on a, a hot rod beetle. We've been around the 100 mile mark with our beetles between 80 and 100. But uh, now we're going to start using, we've started using Tesla batteries. And that's bringing the range up uh, in the Carmen Ghia to uh, 140 miles, uh, the Porsche 180 miles, driving it like a Porsche. More cars are getting converted to electric once more of these hot riders get their hands on uh, electric motors and uh, uh, batteries. Uh, they're going to start experimenting and we'll, we'll see a lot more of these cars on the road. We'll see them. We're not going to hear them coming down the road, but uh, we'll definitely see them. <laughs> From converting classics to converting a culture steeped in cricket, it's time to switch continents and head to India, where Mahindra Racing are doing their part to engineer a newfound love of Formula E. Mahindra wants to start activating what we're doing in Formula E. And if we let's go to the people whom we call the passioneers, because that's the theme of our team is passioneers. Okay, people who are really excited about work and who have a sort of an engineering bent of mind. So we went out to India's largest tech festival, which is Mood Indigo, and wanted to get them introduced to what we're doing at Formula E. We had a footfall of nearly 200,000 people who came for these festivals, and they really came back pretty excited in terms of what motorsport is about, what e-sport is about. And immediately after that, we go to Las Vegas, and our boys stand on a double podium there in e-gaming. Okay, so I think at some point in time, we will try and see if we can bring the connect between what we're trying to do in e-gaming and Formula E, and try and develop that at a grassroots level back in India. I never knew about this. 
and the way they've come here and like they have this awesome experience here that is how i'm learning about it how people are knowing about it and like they are uh, getting more enthusiasm for, for the sport people are getting excited about it so they should continue doing it what's encouraging is okay we were just speaking to the people at oxford brooks university and cranfield university back in in uh, in uk and 20% of their student base is indian students coming to do a masters in motor sport and that's sort of encouraging and i thought we said okay let's take that as a start and go to a step below that back to the graduate school level and try and understand who are those islands of excellence who are looking for a challenge in motor sport mahindra will be adding at least one young engineer every year to a team to start developing and promoting uh, talent and giving people opportunities the good thing about uh, countries where where the menor have been a very strong tradition in, in motor sport launching a new product is easier like if you look at certain other technologies for example in india telephony we literally leapfrogged the landline base and we went directly from no mobility to uh, like having one of the largest penetration the mobile phones in the country similarly where there's no motor sport to understand and i think that's something which we feel pretty confident that we are able to encourage and force going down to a race in india well i think that's going to happen okay how soon is it going to happen it's going to happen very soon uh, we are working on it uh, mahendra and recently uh, president john todd did visit india for the fmsci awards and he did speak about it so there's no pressure on us but at the same time i think india wants a race to come there uh, it's i think just for us to understand how we can put this together at an iconic city to deliver a world class product so i might be putting myself out on a limb but in season 4 i think you can expect india to be on the calendar Well, that's the latest from India, but join us after the break when there'll be plenty more, including taking to the skies, tackling the inner cities, and talking quick fire with Jerome D'Ambrosio. We're here at the London Science Museum for a Street Racers Elec Tech special. And this city has also proved special for hosting the climax of the last two Formula E seasons. And it's the first of these we're going to take you back to now for another fantastic showdown. For the final time this season, all five lights are on. And we go green in London. A lot of wheel spin for Jerome D'Ambrosio in second place. A very slow start from Alex Fontana. Everyone has just about made it past, but it's Sarazan who leads into turn one. Yeah. Here comes oh. Yamamoto into the back of Yano Trulli coming down into Prince Albert. Just completely misjudged that. Oh, and a spin. Boemi spins. The potential leader. championship leader. Can he get back going again without hitting the wall? Yes, oh. he can. But he's lost a couple of places now. And here's a battle between the two dragon cars up the inside. And that is Jerome D'Ambrosio. Sells him the dummy. Oh, goodness me. Dubao tried to come across. Sandberg is into second place. Piquet's through. Piquet's got past Salvador Duran. Nelson Piquet is up into eighth place. And as a result, should be in a position to win the championship. Buemi uses his fan boost now. Can he attack Bruno Senna on the run up towards the chicane? There's he a bit him. of contact between the two of them. If Buemi passes Senna, he's the champion. If he can keep the front of the car tucked in. Look at the understeer. Fight Looks for it. Goes for it. Oh, they make contact and they just both survive. Ah. Goodness me. So close between the pair Great of them. Great driving by both of them. Oh, and it's all kicking off here. Oh, oh. And no. Senna holds on. Win for Sarazan across the line. Third is second. But Senna holds on. And that means as they come towards the final turn and across the line, Sebastian Buemi crosses the line and he is furious with Bruno Senna. Nelson Piquet Jr. wins the FIA Formula E Championship. Oh my God, I cannot believe it. Stefan Sarazan handed a drive-through penalty. Sam Bird is the winner of the E3 here in London. But it's Nelson Piquet Jr. who's the champion. One small step for man, our next stop certainly is not. Now, NASA have always been at the forefront of aeronautical innovation, and they show no signs of stopping. So we thought we'd drop by the NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center to check out their latest work on electric flight. We're out here talking to the public. Many of them don't realize that NASA is an aviation-related enterprise. We have a huge background in aviation and, and before we were a space agency, we were aeronautics. 
And we're better than the LA County Air Show to reveal news of their latest experimental X-plane. NASA's battery-powered 14-propeller X-57, nicknamed the Maxwell, is a revolutionary electric aircraft, intended not only to reduce noise and eliminate carbon emissions, but get us to our destination faster. The X-Plane series is a series of experimental aircraft that the U.S. government has been funding and, and using for research for the last 50 years or so. It started with the X-1, and X-57 is the newest X-Plane in the series. So we've had 57 airplanes in, in the last 50 years, and uh, this is the first electrically powered one. We're trying to tackle several problems with aviation. Noise, emissions, and operating costs. It's expensive to operate these small airplanes. With the battery systems improving with the new electric cars and even your cell phones, everything is kind of coming together where these electric airplanes are now not only possible, but they are actually opening doors to be more competitive than their internal combustion counterparts. We have a, an 800-pound battery system on our airplane with 5,000 lithium-ion cells that are very similar to what go into to these electric vehicles on the road. We need to be able to use full power for 10 minutes or so as we climb to altitude, whereas uh, a lot of these vehicles, you need to accelerate up to highway speeds or in Formula E up to 100 or 150 miles an hour, maintaining that acceleration for 10 minutes. But uh, X57 needs a lot more battery power. This is gonna be a unique uh, airplane. It will uh, define not only operations for electric airplanes, through whether it's all electric or hybrid, but this the idea of safety factors and you know the whole thought process of going about taking this technology and actually flying it and being safe about it. NASA's X-57 airplane will be flying in 2018 and 2019, and, and our full distributed propulsion system will fly around 2020. And those technologies take a while for them to work their ways into commercial designs that you'd see at your local airfield. That's something that we're working actively toward. We're publishing all of our data as it comes in in order to make as much of this technology accessible to aircraft designers as quickly as we can get it. No longer are we going to be driving. We're going to be flying to where we want to go. It's all going to be electric in the system. You're going to collect energy from your house on solar panels, fly to work, and fly back. And that's just going to be the way that we really redefine the way we move. Going towards the larger airplanes, we're, we're not ever going to be able to get away from the jet fuel for the long haul flights, but we can make them more efficient, be smarter with how we use that jet fuel and really reduce the amount of fuel that we use and the amount of emissions we actually produce during these flights. All this flight talk is making me lightheaded, so let's get back on solid ground and focus on an FE star of the future, earning his stripes at DS Virgin Racing. My name is Alex Lynn, the new reserve driver for DS Virgin Racing. When I was younger, I remember watching my first Grand Prix from the stands at Silverstone. One of my earliest and best memories was watching Michael Schumacher exiting the pit lane. Racing feels like it's in my blood. I started in karting when I was 11 years old and went on to Formula Renault where I became UK champion in 2011. After that, I went on to become the Macau Grand Prix and then GP3 champion. It's been a pretty crazy ride so far. But even though I started a bit later, for as long as I can remember, I've only wanted to be a racing driver. Formula E is the kind of series where you have to make calculated risks and split decisions. It's all about margins, pushing it to the edge. On street circuits, there's no room for mistakes. Overcook it, and you're in the wall. Underfry it, and you're just not fast enough. The best thing about Formula E is that everything happens in one day, and just around the corner, my day will come. One to watch in the future, and speaking of which, this Ford Model T in its day was seen as the future. It was the world's first mass production car, and it brought motoring to a whole generation, with 15 million of these made in the early 20th century. Fast forward to this century and mass transport in inner cities has caused chaos for commuters. So in order to beat the traffic, we've been checking out a few new alternative options, which not only could save time, but a bit of street cred too. Here are our top picks of what's on offer. Hi everyone, I'm Grant. Welcome to Irby. Is it a bike? Is it a scooter? Well, in fact, it's an Herb E. The foldable electric-powered two-wheeler is making waves across California and beyond for commuters and fun-seekers alike. 
The idea behind the Irby originally came because one of the trends that I was finding in millennials, uh, it's almost a paradigm shift where they're not buying cars like they, they used to. Instead, they're finding alternative ways to get around. The last mile is one of the things that we are solving. And as you can see here, this is the station here in Pasadena. So we can take our Irby onto this train and jump right on and go into downtown Los Angeles. Lithium ion battery uh, technology has come so far, but for a vehicle like ours, it's very small, lightweight, compact. Um, you need this to pack in a lot of energy into a very small amount of space. Next stop, Mountain View, where we go from two wheels to four, when three Stanford engineering students put their heads together to combine the iconic Californian longboard and an electric motor. This is what they came up with. Hail the boosted board. The last mile is kind of an interesting problem in transportation. You can kind of think of it with airplanes when you have flying into hubs of you know, different airports, and then how do you get people from the airport out to where they actually live? So we noticed longboarding initially by being on campus and seeing a lot of people ride their longboards around campus. Um, and it was also a really efficient form of transportation because you can take it with you. That's one of the key things. You can pick it up and go inside your class, go inside to a train, put it in the trunk of a car. So it's already very portable and it fit into the rest of your life. The technical specs are, are pretty simple. You've got a battery on one end of the board. That's about 100 watt hours, just underneath that, 99 watt hours. That gives you about six to seven miles of range. On the other end of the board, you have the motor control system. So that takes the energy from the battery and powers the motors and makes sure everything is running really well. It also connects over Bluetooth to the remote that you hold in your hand where you can control the throttle so you can accelerate with it and you can control the brake. And they have certainly caught the imagination of Formula E's Lucas Degrassi, who has found his own unique use for the boosted board. Lucas Degrassi is great. So he, um, he was a, an early customer of ours, and it turns out, you know, a lot of what you find out in a startup is not just how you think people will use the product, but them telling you what they've discovered they can do with it. So we found out uh, from him that it's, it makes a great pit vehicle. And if wheels aren't your thing and your preference is more the sophisticated ride, then hold on to your hats because the future has arrived. China's Ehang have released the first human-sized taxi drone, which is due to launch this summer in Dubai. It seems the future of inner city travel may not even need roads. While you choose your favourite mode of future transport, let's fire some questions at one of Faraday Future's dragon races. Name? Jerome D'Ambrosio. Age? Uh, 31. Team? Faraday Future Dragon Racing. Favourite animal? Dogs. Childhood ambition? Be become a race car driver. Adult ambition? Win while being a race car driver. Sporting hero? Ayrton Senna. Greatest strength? Uh, perseverance and uh, hard work. Worst habit? Uh, I wake up very early and when I, when I wake up, I tend to wake up everybody else. Teammates' worst habit? Being French. <laughs> he's, obviously, I'm from Belgium and he's from France, so we always tease each other about, you know, but we speak French and so on, so it's a good banter. Who would play you in a movie? Someone that's uh, pretty short. Not too tall. I'm not, it's difficult because you don't want to say someone, you're going to sound very arrogant, you know? Any hidden talent? I can't speak about that here. <laughs> best EV ever driven? The best EV is the FF91, the new Faraday Future uh, car. It's, uh, I drove it yesterday, just incredible, really incredible. One thing you've never done, but would love to try. Again, I can't talk about that, <laughs> I'm joking. Before we go, let's see what's been happening in the world of Formula E. Let's stick with Faraday Future Dragon Racing for our social media roundup, as Mike Conway makes his Formula E return next month in the Paris E Prix. The Briton will be drafted in to replace regular driver Loic Duval, who will miss his home event due to clashing DTM commitments with Audi. Another driver change for Paris sees Frenchman and Formula V8 3.5 champion Tom Dillman race for Venturi. The 28-year-old tweeted how he was delighted to be making his Formula E debut as he stands in for Mauro Engel, who also has clashing DTM commitments for Mercedes. And to mark Earth Day, Faraday Future tweeted this video of the stunning FF91 to remind us of their mission to contribute to a cleaner and fully sustainable future.
Well, there you have it. Formula E really is at the peak of innovative technology. See what I did there? Thought that myself. Keep those tweets coming at FIA Formula E. That's it from the London Science Museum. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling smarter already. I'll see you next time.